I'm going to tell you a little story today for about half an hour about why what you're doing is so important um, and give you a little context. Um, I've, I only got here on Monday, so I got a chance to spend about half day yesterday going to some of the sessions and meeting some of you. Um, what we're doing in HR now is more important than I have ever seen in my 20 years as an analyst. And so I'm going to talk about what I consider to be HR's essential role in the new world of work. And we've all heard a lot about the new world of work and the fourth industrial revolution. I want to give you some context for that. So let me first, you know, spend a couple minutes on what's going on in the economy and the workplace and the workforce and why HR is so important. And then I'll give you sort of your essentials. The first, of course, is the enormous impact of technology. I've been in the technology industry most of my career. Um, I used to work a long time ago at IBM when there were mainframes. I, worked at, I went to work before there was even voicemail, actually. There were little pink slips. And most of the technology in the early days didn't work for a while, and it took a few years to shake out, and it, it was kind of buggy. And that's all gone, that's all changed. I mean, we just shot, I don't know if you just saw yesterday, we just shot a, somebody, you know, Elon Musk shot, shot a Tesla up into space yesterday. Um, and that worked. Uh, we have robots that can plant crops. We have drones that can fly over the fields and, and determine where the furrows should go and actually monitor the humidity of the soil, plant the, the seeds in the right place, monitor the growth of the seeds, and pick the plants all by robots. And I mean, I think this year, to me, the, uh, the biggest you know, sort of surprise to me is I think the number one Christmas gift was, a, was, a, was an Alexa or some sort of a you know, talking computer. So, so this is really big. And we have heard a lot about how it's going to completely take over our jobs and eliminate all the work that we do. Um, and two years ago, about two and a half years ago, I was asked to give a speech on this, did a lot of work, a lot of research on it, and found that actually the more computers and the more technology we have, the more jobs are created. It's actually the opposite of what you think. We are at a, in the United States, I don't know what it is over here, in the United States, we're almost at a 4% unemployment rate. We're almost below 4% now. There are so many jobs that have been created. The difference is that they're different jobs and they're different kinds of work, and they're in different organization structures, and that's why they need us to help organizations figure this out. Um, and in fact, some of them are, many of the jobs that are created are alternative jobs that we've never seen before. Uber drivers and gig workers, and I was, you know, people driving around delivering pizzas, and I've seen all these different types of work. There's research that was done um, this year, I think it was late last year, that studied all of the jobs that have been created since the 2008 recession, and 98% of them, uh, of the new jobs that were created, not the replacement for the jobs that went away, the new ones, are in these alternative work agreements, these alternative work arrangements, where you're not necessarily a full-time balance sheet worker at your employer. So, that, so these are all the changes that are taking place. We also have seen, and most of you know this, I've talked to quite a few of you yesterday, that the future of work is more IP, more services, more people-oriented products and value. Um, the, uni the United States stock market valuation today is about 85% human capital. It's not physical capital. It's not financial capital. We're valuing companies based on their IP, their brand, their services, their software. If you look at the most highly valued companies, the top four internet companies are worth about $33 billion, I think, last time I checked. They don't really have any that much other than cash. They have IP. And so more and more of the work of that, uh, of the value of the companies that you work in is IP, and I, I know that um, all of you, even if you worked in manufacturing, you're finding that. And today, if you look at the unemployment rate, I like, I like drawing charts because I used to be an engineer. If you look at the unemployment rate, we are almost at an un unemployment rate as low as during the Korean War. The only time we have had this many jobs created is during wartime. So, um, so we're in a very interesting um, time for us as, as, as HR people where there's not only a war for jobs, there's a war for skills, there's a war for talent, there's a war for high potentials, there's a war for almost every role you're in. Um, and let's hope that the economy stays like this for a while because it's playing to many of the strengths we have in organizations. 
We also know that CEOs have figured this out. If you look at the data that, you know, and we just, Deloitte just did a study on this as well, I'll talk about it at the end. Um, CEOs, you know, sometimes CEOs think about people, sometimes CEOs think about technology, sometimes CEOs think about, about their financial uh, markets. But right now, of the 600 or so that were interviewed by the conference board in December, the number one issue was attracting and retaining talent. So we are going to be in a very, at least for the next year, a very tight talent market, looking for people, developing skills, trying to find the right people and put them into the right jobs, which are changing right out from under our feet. Now, there's a little bit of a dark cloud over all this, and there was an article in the New York Times this morning. I, I was telling Kether I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning on some California time and read another article on this, and that is productivity. And let me give you sort of some really interesting data on this. And the reason that I keep bringing this slide up every time I speak is this is our job in HR. We need to start thinking about ourselves as the office of productivity, not the office of HR or compliance or training. Look at the productivity data, and you can read articles about this from almost all the economists around the world. We are in the slowest growth of productivity of any industrial revolution we've ever had. If you go back in time and read about the prior technology revolutions, the invention of the steam engine, the invention of electricity, the first computers in the 1970s, and now the digital revolution, in each one of these revolutions, there is a 20, 25% improvement, 15 to 25% improvement in productivity that comes sometime within a decade later from the inf initial inventions. We haven't seen that yet. And if you look at the history of the prior revolutions, technology revolutions, they all took time to grab hold. And the reason is the generation of management that's in place when the new technology arrives doesn't really know how to use it. What they try to do is the same thing faster than they did before. So when electricity was first introduced into the manufacturing industry, the manufacturing managers put in the machines and they tried to run the factories the same way they had before faster. And of course they didn't, they didn't go any faster because there wasn't you know, real time supply chains, there wasn't just in time information data, they didn't have uh, you know, the tools they needed to do that. And that's the basically I think the world we're in today and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Here in the UK, by the way, I just pulled this up while I was coming over here, this problem is even worse. Um, for some reason, you guys are in even more of a productivity trough than the rest of the world, but this is true in almost every developed economy. The US, the UK, Canada, I've looked at this data from country to country. And the reason for that is not that all this technology is bad, we haven't reorganized our companies to use it effectively yet. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get a little bit further along. Now, the thing that we measure the most in HR is this, it's engagement. And you know, I was talking to, uh, to Richard for a minute. I mean, I'm not a big fan of engagement. We can talk about that in the Q&A on, on, on that term. But um, if you look at engagement going back to the 2008 recession, which is the last sort of big business cycle we went through, and this is data from Glassdoor. In 2008, during the depths of the recession, when we were laying off 20, 30% of the people in companies, the average engagement in Glassdoor, and Glassdoor was a smaller company, so it was a smaller sample size, was about 3.11. Today, it's 3.2. So it really hasn't gone up. And I think you could argue it's probably gone down, you know, relatively speaking. And you've got to ask yourself, why is that? And, and the natural reaction that I hear from a lot of people is, oh, well, you know, all these companies like, you know, the high-tech companies, the companies in Silicon Valley, all these little companies, they're the, they're the really highly engaged companies. But actually, that's not true. If you look at the companies that are on the right side of this curve, they are in every industry, they are in every geography. Some are big, some are small, some are new, some are old. There is no pattern to them. The only thing that is unique about those companies, and I know a lot of them because I'm writing a book on this, is that they are all led by leaders who understand that they're in the people business. There are no, I don't think there are any businesses left that aren't people businesses. And if the people are not engaged and taken care of and um, paid well and treated well by their managers, they're not going to be on the right side of that curve and they understand that. And so you, my message to you in this particular slide is that you can be on the right of this curve no matter what industry you're in, no matter how big you are, how small you are, how fast you're growing, um, or anything else about you. 
Now let's get back to that issue of productivity for a minute. One of the most, I think, interesting things to me as a, you know, close to 62-year-old professional having worked in a lot of different companies in a lot of different places is this. All this technology, all these tools, all these connections, all these video, you know, systems we have, work has gotten harder. We are working harder. We are, we are more stressed out. I'll show you the data on this in a minute. We are more overwhelmed. Every year, it seems to get a little bit worse. I don't know about you. In my particular case, I get emails hundreds a day. I get text messages. I get Twitter messages. I get LinkedIn messages. I get Facebook messages. I've probably got messages waiting for me on WhatsApp. I'm sorry if any of you sent me there. I haven't seen them yet. But this is what work is like. And so my, the reason I bring this up, we wrote, a, we wrote a whole article on this two years ago in the Human Capital Trends, is that we, have to, we in HR have to do something about this. And when I talk to you a little bit about what I mean by productivity, you'll see you're actually sitting on the skills and the capabilities to fix this problem, or at least largely fix it. I mean, you can't completely fix it. And, and I think one of the reasons productivity is declining or slowing, it's not going down, but it's slowing, is because of this. We're getting less work done per hour because we're so distracted. We're always wondering where to spend our time. And that, just in and of itself, as you heard from Tomas last night, is cognitive overload that reduces our product productivity and effectiveness at work. We're working more hours. Um, this is really sort of staggering data. In the US, since, 1990, since 2000, Let's see, since 2000, I think it was 1998, in the last 10 years, or maybe it was 15 years, we have lost a week of vacation. The average employee takes a week less vacation. Same thing is true here. I looked at the data in the UK. We are more stressed out. Um, it's interesting that I've been in, you know, I get invited to do a lot of conferences. One of the conferences that I've been invited to now several times are conferences on mental health. There are a lot of people trying to figure out why do we have a mental health crisis for people at work. And there's research that's, that's shown, and including here, that one of the reasons people are unproductive at work is because they're having a hard time keeping up with their own personal lives and their own, their own mental well-being. And that's why the well-being industry, which I'll talk about in a minute, is becoming so big. So these are some of the sort of problems that we're dealing with in the workplace. The final sort of context for the, for the new world of work that I want to leave you with is, is this one. And we're going to be writing a lot, a lot about this in the upcoming 2018 Deloitte Human Capital Trends. If you interview millennials, and uh, Deloitte does a massive millennial study every year. It comes out around March or April, so it'll be coming out in a month or so. Last year's millennial study had a very, very striking finding. Two-thirds of the millennials in last year's survey, and I think it's going to be the same this year, believe that their economic well-being will be less fortunate than their parents. They are growing up in an economy where they're not in the stock market, which is going up. So they're going to go into Bitcoin and find some new way you know, to, to leverage where the economy is going. They didn't buy a house. They see the housing prices going up. A lot of them are living at home. They're in entry level or early career jobs, and they're trying to move into higher level positions. But there's a lot of people my age in those jobs. Um, they're seeing political instability, they're seeing income inequality, they're seeing homelessness, and they're wondering why the world isn't more fair. And they're looking at businesses and business leaders, and they're saying, you know what, I trust you. I trust you, my employer, my boss, my leader, to be one of the people that I can rely on. And they're pushing organizations to be better citizens and take a more uh, a citizenship role in society. So these are all of the changes and pressures and, and new, new issues that we have to deal with at work. So what are we going to do about this? What is HR's role? Well, as I go back and I look at you know, my own business experience, the research I've done the last 15 or 20 years, uh, what I've read and learned about AI and technology, the bottom line is no matter how much technology we have, no matter how fast AI takes over, it's still all about people. And so what I want to do for the next 15 or 20 minutes is take you through the five, and you know, actually there's a lot more than five, but I only put together five this morning. The five, what I think are essential topics for you to think about in your planning for the year in, in making your organization a better place to work in this new world. The first is something that you probably haven't thought enough about, 
is, re, is, is creating a new organization structure. And let me take a minute and just explain what I mean by that. When we started doing the human capital trends four or five years ago, I've been working on it for four years, um, we discovered something very surprising in 2014. We asked companies to rate all the issues they had in their people, you know, their leadership, their training, their recruiting, their AI, their robotics, their A HR technology, their analytics, on and on and on. The number one issue that companies cited was the inability to operate in a digital way because their organization structure was getting in the way. In other words, companies are organized around an industrial model that no longer really works. The industrial organization of a hierarchy and functional businesses in functional groups, a sales group, a product group, a marketing group, and so forth, which is the way all of us grew up, or the way our job models are designed, our careers are designed, our training is designed, our assessments are designed, our recruiting is designed, is no longer the way to do business. If you look at digital companies, if you look at companies that thrive in digital businesses, they're agile teams, they're networks of teams, they operate as small groups, very independently but interlinked together, and people moving from team to team all the time. Now, I've done a lot of research on this, you know, in the last two years since we started this, and discovered some really interesting things. The first is there's a lot of research that shows that the average, the most optimal team size is about five people. And if you think about your own personal career, probably the most exciting, fun, uh, thrilling work you've ever done is when you were a part of a relatively small team of people that got along well, that had a clear mission, that had the tools you needed to do your job. So, so there's a productivity enhancement of being in a team. People also gravitate towards teams when they are physically co-located. For many years, we thought everybody could be virtual, we could all go on, you know, online and just you know, kind of work from home. And you know what? That's not true. We're building big buildings again. We're asking people to come back in the office. We're, beginning, we're building corporate universities. We have lots of companies building corporate universities because we're realizing that physical proximity creates intimacy and relationships and opens up lines of communications between people that improve engagement and productivity. Now, the key is, how do you do this? How do you create small teams, service teams, product teams, uh, sales teams, but make them, in, but work together in a way that they don't compete with each other, that they don't conflict with each other, so that they're working on a common mission, so they're working on common goals, so the organization can move ahead. I'm not going to give you the whole secret to that, but it is possible to do that. You do it through shared culture, you do it through shared leadership, you th do it through new talent practices, and a whole bunch of new ways to run the organization. This is just a small list of the things that have changed in the organizations of the future. Now, I first started sort of studying this, you know, three years ago or so when Zappos started publishing articles on holacracy. And everybody um, thought that was a good idea. We'll get rid of managers, right? We'll just have teams and they'll run themselves. That didn't turn out to work so well. But what did happen is a lot of companies started to experiment with Agile and applying the principles of Agile, which started in software, it actually started long ago at IBM when I was there, um, and implementing the Agile principles, the Agile manifesto, it's called, at work. And this is an example of some of the practices that change. My personal experience with this is at Deloitte. Deloitte is a magnificent company that has no organization chart. There, you, you cannot find one. It doesn't exist. Everybody is changing jobs all the time. But we know what to do. We know what to work on. We know who's important. We know what the skills are that we need for a given project. We spend a lot of time getting to know each other. We spend a lot of time communicating with each other. And there's reward systems and value systems similar to this chart that allow companies like Deloitte to thrive as more like a network and less like a hierarchy. And I think what you're going to find is that all of you are going to find this opportunity in your company regardless of what industry you're in. That's number one. Number two is management. Now, if you have read history, and you certainly know the history of big companies, the reason we have managers is because we all used to be sort of indentured servants. We did what we were told, and the managers organized the work for us 
And we, as production employees or workers, did the things that we were told to be done do by our managers. And that goes back, actually, to the railroads and some very, very early you know, manufacturing companies, uh, if you look at the history of organizations. Today, where 80% of the value of a company is IP, services, inventions, software, managers, we don't need those kinds of managers, as many of them. We need some. We need managers that empower people. We need managers that build teams. We need managers that coach people. We need managers that collect feedback. And so that's number two. When you look at leadership effectiveness and the leadership pipeline, and research is all, every year there's lots and lots of research on this. The latest one came out from DDI, I just read it a couple of weeks ago. The, the people's assessment, companies' assessment of their leadership pipeline, the strength of their leadership pipeline, dropped by 6% just this last year. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the reasons is the demographic change. So we have a lot of young people in the workforce that haven't been moved into leadership roles fast enough, and they're, they're sort of itching to get there, and they're being held back by other people that are in the way. The other is the fact that we actually need a different type of leader. If you look at the leadership characteristics of high-performing companies today in a digital business, a more agile business is doing, by the way, digital businesses are not companies that sell digital stuff. They're companies that operate in a digital way. So if you think about a bank that becomes a digital business, it, be, it, it delivers its products and services to you through a digital platform, but behind the scenes, it's still a bank. It's still dealing with money and interest rates and loans and doing all the, you know, creating all those products, but you're interacting with it in a more dynamic, real-time way. I mean, my definition of digital, which I've used sometimes in the learning presentations, is digital means delivering your product and service to where your customer is right now. So it, it's not just using technology. And what you find in digital companies, companies that have learned how to do this well, they operate differently. Their managers have different skills. They lead in different ways. And this is research that Deloitte has done called Digital DNA that shows you the 23 things that are different about leadership today than five years ago or 10 years ago. So this is one of the things that you need to be aware of. And this is something that you have a lot of control over because most of you um, have an enormous impact on your leadership assessment, your leadership development, the way you um, uh, decide who goes into leadership and reward leaders and all those things. The second area of leadership I want to touch on is this topic of feedback. This is a chart that's about a year old, but I think it's kind of a funny chart. I like to show it. The way we used to do feedback in companies was we would say, once a year, you can tell us what you think of us. We'll give you an engagement survey. And once a year, we'll tell you what we think of you in a performance appraisal. And for the rest of the year, just do your job, right? Well, that's absurd, right? I mean, it's really crazy that we set it up that way. And I don't know where this all started. You know, it goes back to, you know, long, long ago, IO psychologists came up with this idea of this annual survey. But we're past that. That isn't enough. We need some form of continuous feedback process. And that has been, you know, that concept and this idea, and I know a lot of you talked about it in some of your sessions today, has really taken off. Now, when we studied, we studied performance management in our business around 2005 or 2006. And at that point in time, 75% of the companies we surveyed told us that the reason they do performance management is for competitive assessment, to weed out the low performers. You know, the, the old force ranking. Today, a year ago, when we did the survey again, we found the complete opposite was true. 75 to 80 percent of the companies that we surveyed told us that the reason they're doing performance management is to improve performance, to coach and develop people, not necessarily to weed out the poor performers. That's an indication of really, it's a symptom of the change in business models that we have. Now we've been through, and I saw the presentation yesterday uh, by, by Dan Fos, we've been through a lot of thinking about this as an industry. We thought we should do away with ratings, right? I mean, maybe some of you experimented with that. Um, we looked at getting rid of these forms and putting more tools in place and putting in top-down goals and having cascading goals. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been experimented with, but where the industry has landed is that performance management is a continuous process. And if you can implement a, a continuous performance management process, you will make a major step forward 
towards that organization of the future that I mentioned a minute ago. Part of that is feedback. And I love this chart because it just, it just makes it so clear. The reason we need feedback is there's so much information in your employees' hands, in your employees' minds, about what's going on in the organization that isn't reaching the decision makers. We need better systems for doing that. And what's happening, thanks to the technologies like Workday and the other tools in the market, is you now have a set of tools that allow employees to give you real-time feedback almost all the time. Now, it takes a little while, it takes a year or two to get this all up and running and really build the culture of feedback. But I've talked to companies now for two or three years that have been doing this that are getting regular feedback on a continuous basis. And they're not just learning about management. They're learning about operations. They're learning about safety problems. They're learning about fraud. They're learning about all sorts of things that they didn't have before. At Deloitte, we've just changed the whole performance management process based on feedback. And what the research at Deloitte has now proven is that the teams that have the highest level of engagement based on the eight questions shown here in the feedback process are the highest performing teams financially. So, high, and I've seen this in other clients. The more feedback people give, the higher performing they become. The research, research is proving that now. Number three, the employee experience. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is because I know a lot of you have talked about it, and there was a wonderful presentation yesterday by Salesforce on this. We have got to fix and deal with the employee experience. The employee experience is very complex. It isn't simple. We came up with at least 20 things, this is the model we developed, that try to define the issues that affect people at work. Culture is a very significant part of this. Research done two decades ago on culture found that companies that define their mission, their values, through their entire stakeholder community outperform their peers by eightfold over a long period of time. So culture is one of the things you can control. We also know that when the culture feels right, when people fit into the culture, they will rate your company higher. This is the correlation between the Glassdoor rating and different questions in the Glassdoor survey. And the one that is the most highly correlated is the question of culture. Culture is three to four times more important than than pay, than earnings, in driving your employee experience. We also know that we need to help people have a more healthy experience at work and give them a more healthy environment. There's lots of things going on in the area of well-being. Well-being is becoming a part of HR. It isn't comp and ben anymore. I know it started in comp and ben, but it needs to move into the era of performance. And there are tools and technologies and monitoring systems and all sorts of education and training that are now making that possible. We can redesign the workplace. We can make it more um, humanistic. We can give people nap rooms. We can give people open spaces. There's so many creative things we can do. And these things are really important in building the employee experience. The final point I want to make on the employee experience is this one, diversity and inclusion. And I know there have been lots of sessions on this here, too. We did research, I think it was about a year and a half ago, on talent management, and we looked at about 70 or 80 different talent practices and correlated them against business outcomes. And then we aggregated them all together into four levels like we do all the time. And the ones that characterized the most high-performing companies were what we called inclusive talent practices, fairness, transparency, um, processes that force people to take an inclusive view of who gets promoted, who gets paid, how performance is managed, who gets hired. Those are part of the work environment as well. The fourth point I want to talk about is the career. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit over, so I'm going to speed up a little bit and get through the last two a little bit quickly. If you're going to thrive in a world of ever-changing jobs, you're going to have to build a better model for careers. People are living longer. They're going to be working in your company into their 70s. They might have a 70 or 80 year career. They will be working through their entire life. They won't want to necessarily retire at 65. They might want to stay longer. They, they may actually need a new role in a less senior role but a more mentor role. We need to find a role for more senior people. Jobs are becoming technology and soft skills. If you look at the skills of the future, the most um, high in-demand job today is machine learning. But if you look at the skills that LinkedIn believes are the, are the most in-demand skills right now, and this was just from December, half of them are soft skills. The blue ones are soft skills. 
So we have a lot of new skills to develop and a lot of old skills to polish up. Even the skills of technical professionals. This is research on the role of a data scientist. The skills now required for data scientists are creativity, teamwork, problem solving, writing, and research. The technical skills are being automated faster every day. It was only two or three years ago that we couldn't find enough data scientists, and now more and more of that job's been um, automated as well. And we also know that we can retrain people. This is a really interesting piece of research that came out the World Economic Forum last month. They did a study, a bunch of um, analysts did a study, and looked at all of the jobs that are expected to change in the future. <clears throat> and they found that not, something like 96% of these jobs could be, re, people could be retrained in these jobs with approximately one year of additional education or skills development. So it's not gonna take you 10 years to create the jobs of the future. So one of your roles, number four, is to build this career infrastructure so your employees can evolve and grow and learn into these jobs of the future. The last one I wanna talk about, since I'm a little bit short on time, is technology. And we're gonna talk about technology in a minute. You know, technology is a wonderful thing. And it would be nice if it solved all our problems, but it takes a while to build technology. And the HR technology industry is very big and very complex. And it goes in waves. And we've been through a couple of big waves. In the early 2000s, we went through the integrated talent management wave, where all the integrated, all the small talent management vendors got bought up and integrated into sort of ERP-like systems. Then we had the emergence of products that were cloud-based and really easy to use. And those were what we called systems of engagement. We said, let's make the HR system a system of engagement so it's easier to use and employees could really use it. But what you find now, and we'll talk about this in the Q&A, is that even that has not yet really improved the work experience, the work life that people have in their jobs. And we're entering a new world of technology that facilitates teams, that brings people together, that applies AI to work, and actually makes people's work life better. And I think where we're going to is a set of HR technology that actually does make your work better. There are tools in the market today, for example, that will automatically survey the people that you email on a regular basis collect information from them, feedback information on your skills, and coach you on those skills, all driven by AI. Those are the kinds of tools that we're gonna see a lot more of in the next couple of years that are gonna make technology better. We're going to be talking to our systems. We're going to have conversational um, interfaces to these systems. They're going to be more AI-based. They're going to be smarter. They're going to be listening and paying more attention to us. And they're going to be taking advantage of this network and helping us understand the network. And one of the things that I think is going to be very transformational in the area of technology is tools to manage teams. If you go back to the very beginning of the talk where I talked about teams, we need a new breed of systems that helps us manage teams. Slack, Facebook, uh, Microsoft Teams, these new tools are going to be very transformational in work. And one of the things that you should be doing as an HR person or an HR team is talking to your IT department about this new breed of team-based tools because they will become the HR platforms of the future. So let me just, just wrap it up really quick here. Um, the final thing I just want to leave you with is that you're going to have to communicate this to your CEOs. Most CEOs do understand that the job of the future is very people-centric, but a lot of them don't. An interesting study came out from Corn Ferry about six months ago, and they surveyed you know, several hundred CEOs about becoming a digital business. And they, they basically the answer was that almost two-thirds of the CEOs said that the key to becoming a digital business is to have better technology. And I would push back on that, and I would say that is not the key to being a digital business. The key is to manage your people better, and they will in turn build you the technology and the tools and the services you need. And you're going to have to make that point clear to your organization because you're sitting on you know, the five most important things that are going to really transform your organization for the future of work. Okay, thank you all for inviting me this morning. It's been just a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to answering some questions.